I have two homes. I live in the US and I live in Lagos. Each time I'm home in Lagos, I'm struck by how many neighborhoods, both in affluent and non-affluent areas, are full of stagnant water. And so I am vigilant about malaria, so vigilant that it annoys my family and friends. At home, I frequently examine the mosquito nets on the windows to check for gaps. I am obsessive about keeping fully shut at all times the doors that lead outside. A frequent refrain that friends and family hear from me when they visit me is, may choose us to a mosquito, which means shut the door quickly because of mosquitoes. I always carry a repellent spray in my handbag. When I go out in the evenings to a restaurant or to visit a friend, I bring out the canister from time to time and spray myself. My friends roll their eyes at all of this. It's just malaria, they say. They have become so conditioned to having malaria. Malaria has become so commonplace that they are blasé about it. They think malaria is inevitable, but it isn't. We don't have to have malaria. I certainly don't want to have malaria. And so, dramatic as it may sound, I live in fear of malaria because it is such a miserable experience, because I worry that if I get malaria after not having had it for a while, it will be even worse. Still, despite all my precautions, I got malaria in December, and I was indeed beyond miserable. It left me unable to write, to think, to do. A waste of a week. But it is my two and a half year old daughter that I worry the most about. There is so much from my childhood that I would like my daughter to also have, the outdoor play, the sense of adventure. But I do not want her to be as intimately familiar with malaria as I was growing up. I do not want her to be familiar with getting injections for malaria medicine as I was. I still remember starting to cry even before my parents and I got to the medical center and into the nurse's room full of terrifying little vials of medicine. I would be feverish from malaria, my head aching and my stomach in an acute stage of unrest. My father would hold me across his lap, gently but firmly so that I didn't move, and my mother would soothe my forehead while everyone coaxed me not to tighten my muscles so that the needle wouldn't break. And I would lie very still, holding my breath, anxiously waiting to feel the first prick of the needle. And then my screaming would begin anew. Now, because I am so vigilant to prevent my daughter from getting malaria, I spray every exposed part of her skin whenever she's in Lagos. I spray her ears, her toes, her neck. I'm curious about repellents, and I try different ones. Should I use the repellent with DDT on a two-year-old? Does the repellent made of natural oils really work? And so in Lagos, my daughter always smells of insect repellent. And each time I hold and hug her, I wish she didn't have to smell like that. I wish she smelled of more innocent smells, the scent of babies, of fresh talcum powder and baby lotion. I wish she did not have to wear on her skin the proof of her mother's eternal vigilance against malaria. Despite all of these efforts, a few months ago, I discovered a red and itchy bump on her forehead, a mosquito bite. I went into mild panic. I bought camelquin in readiness for malaria. I watched her like a hawk for symptoms, but fortunately, malaria didn't come but it could very well have happened. And I found myself thinking of how wonderful it would be to be free of this vigilance. How wonderful to let her play outside without worry. Of course, playing outside means being bitten by insects because that is the nature of nature. But how wonderful to know that insect bites, while perhaps painful, would not be the possible precursor of a horrible disease. How wonderful it would be if children no longer missed school because of malaria, if workers no longer missed work, 
if people no longer wasted days and weeks in the lethargy of malaria. How wonderful it would be if those roadside medicine hawkers no longer had to dispense dubious pills for people who cannot afford to go to the doctor. How wonderful it would be if Nigeria were a country where foreigners could travel to without first anxiously taking malaria prophylactics. Today, we are talking about self-driving cars and drones that deliver our groceries. And yet, this ancient disease, this disease that we know can be conquered because it has been conquered in different parts of the world, is still killing so many people in the Commonwealth. So many that malaria is responsible for half of all the deaths in the Commonwealth. We have the science and we have the knowledge to beat malaria. It is doable. May we also have the will to do it. Thank you. Terrifying as that is, you can rest assured that I've been told that an enormous mosquito net has been erected at the entrance to this hall, so don't worry, they can't get us in here. You're safe uh, while you're in here. Um, as I mentioned before, throughout the day, we've been hearing from all sorts of different voices um, and hearing about all the various pieces of the puzzle that need to come together in order to eliminate uh, this disease, from new nets, new drugs, new insecticides, and to data as well, and the technology needed to actually get to those individual communities that are so badly affected. Now, I'm so thrilled to say we're going to be hearing from the leaders themselves, those that can actually commit their time and their energy, their resources, to actually take on this disease. So please welcome to the stage Ms. Jayatma Wikramanayaka, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Mr. Bill Gates, Honorable Minister Louise Mushikiwabo, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, his Excellency, Dr. Barnabas Subusiza de Lamini, His Royal Highness, the Duke of York, Dr. Willy Mpanjo Shimbosho, and welcome back to the stage, please, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Your Royal Highness. Welcome. Please do take a seat. Your Royal Highness. Very good. Do take a seat. Hello again. Nice to see you again. To see you again. Right now that everyone is uh, is here and seated, and what a phenomenal panel that we have for you all today. Um, I think it's only right that I give everyone their formal title. So, bear with me. This might take some time. Um, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, welcome. Uh, Honourable Minister Louise Mushikiwaba, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation for uh, Rwanda. His Excellency Dr. Barnabas Subusiza Dlamini, Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Swaziland, representing His Majesty King Muswati III of the Kingdom of Swaziland and Chair of the African Leaders Malaria Alliance. His Royal Highness the Duke of York, Patron of Malaria No More UK. Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, Director General of the World Health Organization. Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Ms. Jayathma Wickramanayaka, UN Special Envoy on Youth. Dr. William Panja Shimbosho, board chair of the RBM Partnership to End Malaria. And also Chimamanda, we welcome back Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, our storyteller and award-winning author. Now, to start uh, this panel, we heard from this man earlier on today about the, the, the challenges ahead that we're all going to be facing. He has been a pioneering, relentless, and enormously generous force behind the global malaria campaign. So please welcome to the lectern to address us, the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Mr. Bill Gates. Thank you. 
Well, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for being part of this malaria summit. The commitments made today and the attendance of many government, private sector, and global leaders uh, renews my confidence that we can turn the table on malaria despite the incredible challenge. Our foundation is committing today an additional billion dollars of funding uh, over the next five years to match this ambition of having the burden of malaria in the Commonwealth and putting us on track to end malaria for good. This morning I got to talk about how I think uh, we'll look back and see this as a turning point. Uh, the point where we acknowledged uh, what we've learned, uh, looked at the last two years, uh, where the resistance has caused the cases to go up, uh, took our innovative pipeline and uh, our best practices in delivery, uh, our understanding of the numbers, and uh, went to work uh, to get those tools out to save lives and start on an uh, even better path uh, for ending malaria for good. Uh, it's fantastic uh, that the United Kingdom is host this. Uh, they are one of the, the leaders in the fight against malaria in many different ways. Uh, the research capability uh, that's been here uh, for generations is amongst the strongest in the world, and uh, these are great partners, uh, both universities and uh, private sector companies here helping to, to get these tools done, uh, drive the cost down, uh, and make sure uh, that we have them available to use all over the world. Uh, also, the UK has been very generous, uh, not only helping to fund the R&D, uh, fund country programs, but also uh, as a major participant in the Global Fund, um, in particular now incentivizing the private sector to come in and take on a larger role. Uh, it's equally appropriate uh, that we're here in the context of the Commonwealth, uh, because in the Commonwealth, uh, the work we're talking about will make a big difference. Uh, it's a particular pleasure to have His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, here today uh, to speak about the, how the UK and the Commonwealth uh, are prepared to address malaria. Uh, it's a heavy toll, uh, but a toll that's gone down, and a toll that, as we eliminate it, will uplift uh, the lives of, of so many of the members of the Commonwealth. Uh, His Royal Highness has been a great supporter of development for decades, and I look forward to his remarks. Thank you. Dale, thank you very much indeed. Now please join me then in welcoming His Royal Highness Prince of Wales, who has of course championed so many causes across the Commonwealth, including climate change, uh, sustainability, and youth engagement. I believe we're going to address this, sir. Do come up. And uh, whilst we're doing that. Presidents, Prime Ministers, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I really was most touched to have been asked to uh, here today to say a few words to such a very distinguished group of experts at this uh, important and potentially pivotal meeting. Combating malaria is without doubt an issue of truly global urgency. And uh, I am encouraged and inspired to see how real is the determination of the international community to overcome this dreadful disease. And in this respect, I would, I would like to recognize and thank not only our co-conveners, Bill Gates uh, and Dr. Winnie Mpanju Shumbushu for the unstinting and critical support that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and RBM Partnership to End Malaria has provided, but also the Director General of the World Health Organization for the WHO's enduring labors in this area. Now, however, despite the uh, recent hard-run successes over the last 12 years of a 25% decline of new cases and a fall of 42% of deaths uh, from the disease, it is tragically evident that much still remains to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I've been lucky enough to travel throughout the Commonwealth and beyond for a very long time. 
unbelievably, if it seems to me at least, for the last, uh, I tried to work out the other day, 65 years, and have only too often witnessed at first hand the devastation that malaria can wreak on communities. I'm delighted, therefore, that this issue is being addressed uh, during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. The statistics show that the Commonwealth, with 90% of its population at risk, is directly and disproportionately exposed to malaria. As a response to this, and as is evidenced by your attendance today, the Commonwealth has shouldered its responsibilities and is playing, as it must continue to play, a vital role in fighting a disease that has beleaguered our family of countries so tragically and for so long. I would therefore like to congratulate, if I may, all those who have been involved in the Malaria No More campaign for the phenomenal progress that has been achieved since 20, 2006. Yet, as you will know far better than me, the increasing challenges of drug and insecticide resistance, as well as climate change, and in certain instances, losses of habitat and biodiversity caused by deforestation, are now threatening to undermine and even reverse those successes. Happily, much can be done when people are determined to work together. And an example of this is Sri Lanka, where when I first visited back in 1998, the country recorded nearly a quarter of a million cases of malaria. Today, 20 years later, Sri Lanka has completely eliminated the disease and has been declared a malaria-free zone. Another such example of successful joint action is the fight against polio. For when the Commonwealth Heads of Government met in Vancouver in 1987, polio virus was one of the deadliest diseases in the world, with 350,000 cases of crippled and killed children occurring annually in 125 countries. At that Chogham in 1987, Commonwealth leaders pledged to eradicate polio. And as a consequence, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was formed the following year. Hundreds of millions of children have since benefited from life-saving polio vaccines. And today, polio is endemic in only two countries. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a proven track record in effecting change. I've always firmly believed that the Commonwealth is uniquely placed to take on such pressing global challenges. For our shared values, history, and culture provide us with a remarkable and potent platform for transformative action. From those countries within the Commonwealth, that are most burdened by malaria, such as uh, Nigeria and India, to those that have eliminated it, such as Sri Lanka, to members nearing elimination, such as Belize and Malaysia, and key donors, such as the United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada, we, we have the leadership, the multi-sectoral investments, the cutting-edge science, and vitally, the committed engagement from business and civil society to ensure that we play our part in meeting the Sustainable Development Goal 3.3. This, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, far better than me, intersects with many of the other SDGs and specifies the reduction of malaria cases and deaths by at least 90% by 2030, as well as the elimination of the disease completely from an additional 35 countries. The commitments that we are about to witness are vitally important and will make, I'm sure, a very great difference. But in addition to these and the work currently being supported by the Malaria No More program, 
<clears throat> I do think it is absolutely vital that we should perhaps pause just to consider how our efforts to overcome malaria specifically go hand in hand with our work as guardians of the planet more generally. We know that tropical deforestation and climate change are greatly complicating our attempts to eliminate malaria. But critically, they also threaten and reduce biodiversity, which holds some of the keys to a solution. RT Mises, in, for instance, is now one of our standard and most effective treatments and is derived, of course, from a natural plant, sweet wormwood. Who knows, ladies and gentlemen, what uh, natural plants or predators we may need to call upon in future if we are <laughs> to be successful in preventing and treating malaria. It has long seemed to me that testing the planet's ecosystems to destruction is utter madness, to say the least, precisely, precisely because of the accelerating collateral consequences. If our planet was a patient, and it is certainly becoming sicker and sicker in our case, no self-respecting doctor would have failed to make the necessary intervention by now to treat it. Therefore, if I may make a plea in such an august gathering, it would be that a truly integrated approach should be taken at a landscape level, as well as at scientific, educational, and advocacy levels in the implementation of the next generation of interventions. For without such an approach, I fear that we will go fatally compromised into a battle that we cannot afford to lose. I do worry, I'm afraid, that we may have gravely underestimated the systemic nature of the threats that we face. The successful achievement of the SDGs and within them the fight against malaria is not part of some a la carte uh, development menu. It is the prerequisite for our survival. And as I have tried to say over and over again to the point of boring myself and probably many others to death, we simply do not have the luxury of deferring the necessary action to future generations. And nor is it fair that we should shackle them with the consequences of our inaction. It is, however, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful demonstration of the Commonwealth at its best that we should witness such a vow determination to tackle the pernicious disease of malaria. Above all, your commitments here today will prevent much suffering, illness, and death. And for that, we will owe you a very great debt of gratitude. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, well, Hannes, thank you very much indeed. And as we will see shortly, the Commonwealth is indeed very, very well represented here today. So we thank you very much uh, for those words. Now, this summit, this malaria summit, is co-hosted not just by the UK, but also uh, by the governments of Rwanda and Swaziland. So first, may I invite up to the podium to speak to us the uh, Honourable Minister of Rwandan Foreign Affairs, Louise Mushikiwaba. <laughs> 